Hi there, it's Kevin with the Rogue Market. Here with just a little bit of a quick video of the top five cards that I get bottlenecked while trying to build popper decks. Now, first of all, you should always be utilizing this page that I have open here. This is just the format staples page over at MG Goldfish. It compiles all of the deck lists and then figures out which cards see the most play in the combined 5-0 finishes, all the, the uh, popper format challenges. They do this for every format, not just popper. And it's a, a good way to get ahead of price spikes. However, for this particular video, I'm, I'm going to say that this can be a little bit misleading when it actual, actually comes to the amount of cards that are used in an, any given format. Because what this usually tends to show is just the top for performing decks. So the most uh, amount of cards that are used in the top for performing decks. And so when you have one or two decks that are just dominating the meta, or even at a higher percentage than the vast majority of other decks, then this will tend to give you a little bit mis misleading information about the totals of cards. So right now you can see in Popper that the most played cards are definitely cards that are played out of the Delver lists and the Boros Monarch lists. And then a lot of other cards though, uh, don't start showing up until you really start to get down into the list of these. So my experience, though, building Popper, though, is Popper is like any other format. You have your array of players all the way from competitive to casual, and you never, never want to disregard the more intermediate and casual players because they buy decks as well. And for every 5-0 deck, there's going to be a 4-1 deck, there's going to be a 3-2 deck, there's going to be a 2-3 deck, and there's going to be a 1-4 and a 0-5 deck. Those cards had to have been purchased as well. And yes, they might be, some of these will be tier decks that go 0-5 as well, but oftentimes those 0-5, 1-4, 2-3, those type of decks, those casual decks, those intermediate decks, those more uh, decks with the personal touches or people want to be unique, uh, those those require cards to build as well. And that is why I've compiled a list of five cards that after I've created my Popper Battle Box, you can check my main channel. I showcase my Popper Battle Box quite often. I'm going to have a deck list or the, the, the list of the Popper Battle Box deck lists up on my website sometime. It's on, it's, it's on my to-do list for sure. Uh, well, I think we're up to 34 strong decks. I, might, I think I killed one of the decks, so I think we're down to 33. I like to keep it around the 32, uh, as that allows me to do like a 32-man tournament. Uh, if we get 32 people to show up, I'll have a deck for everyone uh, to actually play. Uh, so far, we haven't ever hit 32. I think the highest we've had is is in the 20s for a popper tournament. But anyway, uh, let's just get to it. This, again, comes from experience of me ha having to build the popper battle box. Uh, there are ma mainly I have all the tier decks built in the popper battle box, as well as any decks that I consider uh, either unique enough, but still playable enough that they're not just going to get stomped. So th throughout those 32 decks, I've come to some choke points or some bottlenecks is what I like to call it, of cards that... I run out of and have to order uh, due to building a variety of different decks. So let's start off with white. White by far, the card that I run out of the most is Prismatic Strands. Prismatic Strands is, and again, this will have a lot to do with the rarity of these particular cards. Yes, they're all commons, but a, a common from Judgment is a lot harder to come by than a common that has been printed you know, recently in Scars of Mirrodin or a Modern Master sets or something like that. Those typically, when I've bought a lot of collections throughout my lifetime, we have plenty of those cards. You're not running out of those cards anytime soon. The market also still has them from 15 to 25 cents for these, these heavily played uh, cards in Popper. However, cards like Prismatic Strands, the rarity is a lot higher for these because they were only printed in Judgment. And Prismatic Strands is a, a fog effect, basically, but it's a really, really powerful fog, fog effect because you can flash it back with just tapping an untapped white creature control. So it's a two-for-one fog, and this deck is really good against like the Insight Out combo decks, the uh, Blitz decks, any deck that's trying to kill you very, very quickly. The Prismatic Strands is super, super effective against. It's also decent versus burn because it basically uh, negates two burn spells. And as you build a lot of, of decks in Popper, you tend to run out of these. It's typically, Mono White Heroic will have these in the sideboard. Any token-based deck will want them because it also protects against sweepers like the Swirling Sandstorm or the Electricery, and it's really your go-to deck. But even decks like the White Black Tron and White Black Pestilence, or even these main decks like the Godotha Boros or the, the, the Red White Weenies, will include Prismatic Strands. Uh, I've had these in, in plenty of, of decks that even Splash White, and really only Splash White for a very few cards, Prismatic Strands being one of them. So this is a card that I, I tend to go through quite a bit. Most lists run between 
two to three, but even three to four is not uncommon if you really need to protect your army. Uh, so if you are looking to invest in Popper, if if we if you think that Popper is going to have another resurgence, which I I personally think it is after we have the 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 mythic qualifier that's going to be held for the Popper format, I think we're going to start seeing more Popper uh, events in paper, and that will incentivize people actually buying the cards. And Tony Community College isn't going anywhere. He continues to promote it. Every time he has one of those Q&As with like Gavin Verhey or the uh, Magic the Gathering uh, creators or staff or whatnot, uh, he always asks about Popper. And eventually, I think it's going to have the you know the, the 2.0 explosion. This, of course, was the first explosion you saw. Prismatic Strands go from $0.50 cents all the way to 250 And it's had some price settlement, but Prismatic Strands by far has had a lot less of a price settlement than many cards like a lot of them did spike up to this like 10 times the amount of what they were going for and then it crashed at least 50 percent of that value but prismatic strands has only gone down from about three to about a, 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 a buck 50 so it, it's yeah i guess this one has crashed about 50 percent of its value uh since this has had some price adjustment uh with uh, people especially vendors acquiring massive amounts of, of popper cards and then adjusting accordingly to what the market demands so prismatic strands is one that if we do have a popper craze uh from white i think will go up the quickest let's go on to blue blue is actually a card i want banned in popper so just keep that with a grain of salt because i think it's just, just too powerful and this is preordain preordain is one of many cards you can use in popper and it's the most powerful of the effects i uh, usually decks will use preordain as a full play set or, um, and, not really or, it's usually always going to be a four of in every blue deck is Preordain. And then they're going to use either Brainstorm or Ponder to go with Preordain. So that's that's why I like Preordain more. The, the amount of copies is actually quite low. This is M11. M11 did have quite a bit of printing. Uh, in comparison to a lot of core sets, it was one of the core sets that was very popular due to the Titans seeing a ton of plain standard at the time. And so these did sell. I mean, Magic 2011 has quite a bit of stock, but the only other printings that this card had was from the Dual Deck Fencer versus Koth, which is really, really low, and the Commander 2015, which, I mean, it might as well be a Mythic in that set. There's the, amount of, the same amount of Mythics or the same amount of Rares that you released in the Commander sets. And I think it was only printed in one of them. It wasn't in multiple of the Commander sets. So it also has a lot of demand from Legacy. Of course, it's banned in Modern, uh, but if you lo do look at the Popper, it is the one that does show up in the commonly played Popper decks as the number two card next to Pyroblast. In fact, this is the first one that with four as the number of played on average in decks. So again, like I'm saying, this is a four of in every deck that uses Preordain. and they, they, they use four of them because it's the best one of its type. If you look at Brainstorm, it's, it's getting 3.7, uh, not quite the four. And if we come down here to Ponder, uh, Ponder is way far down now. Huh? Ponder gets 3.5 and is using 13% of the, the deck. So a lot of these blue decks, they're definitely choosing the Preordain. Uh, at a higher rate than both Brainstorm and Ponder. And in my opinion, it's the rarest of these type of cards as Brainstorm has been printed in basically every master set and the Ponder and Preordain has not. But Ponder did have two standard printings, whereas Preordain has just had the one standard printing as well as the uh, supplemental product printing. So Preordain, again, is one of these cards that I just like the price trajectory. It did have that popper explosion here. This was starting to go up anyway from Legacy for... Uh, basically it's 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 entire life it looks like it's starting to go back up again and uh if this doesn't get banned though of course i you could definitely see this card continue to go up in value this definitely does need a reprint and is probably pretty easy to reprint in a lot of supplemental products but when they're looking at reprints they tend to kind of shy away from cards that are banned in modern so it does have that going for it let's go on to black black is a card that did just get recently reprint, re reprinted this is chainer's edict now, Chainer's Edict is very flexible, goes in so many different decks from anywhere from White Black Pestilence to Mono Black Control. If we do see some bannings, I actually like Mono Black Control because I think a lot of people get away from the Black Blue Delver list and then go strictly back to Mono Black Control. And then if the meta does change, even those Black Blue Delver decks will start using Chainer's Edicts again. Right now, they're using like Snuff Outs and Disfigures because they're fighting other Delver decks or other Kodotha Boros decks, and Chainer's Edict tends to be pretty pretty poor uh, when it ends up removing stuff like Augur of Bolus's or Thraben Inspectors. 
But if the, the format does get back to Kiln Fiends and uh, you know Slippery Bogles especially, then Chandra's Edict is your go-to card. Or if you have to kill, if if like the Black Blue decks or just the Black Control decks go on to the Delver or the 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 Gurmog Anglers, that's when Chandra's Edict is a lot better than cards like Snuff Out and Disfigure and and those type of cards. And we have seen Chandra's Edict as the most played removal spell before in Popper, and it's just a matter matter of time before I think it will get that slot again. Uh, this card was very, very expensive before the printing in Ultimate Masters, and I think the supply is starting to dry out from Ultimate Masters. You can see that the low is about a buck forty-nine. It's back up to a buck seventy. I used to be able to find these for copies for fifty cents to seventy-five cents all day long, and even that outlet's kind of dried up for me. It really seems like if I'm going to buy them on, on TC Player, you're looking about a buck twenty-five a piece, and all the vendors are already back up to a buck twenty-nine uh, and higher. Uh, for this particular card what i like about this card though it is the best in its slot for the sacrifice base effects because you can flash it back and most decks actually do tend to like that i think there's only one black deck that i decided to run a different card over chainer's edict and that was zombies that likes guest verdict because that dishes a damage as well as instant speed making an opponent sacrifice a creature but the vast majority of black decks don't care about the instant speed versus the sorcery speed effect of chainer's edict they just need to get rid of a threat and have this be a two for one uh you have all other cards like diabolical edict and the uh, innocent blood there are options for decks but again this one just tends to be the most powerful one you can see it uses a lot of decks in popper uh, mono black, some of these soul titron lists, black red controls, black white controls, white black pestilence, this black red discard, and even blue black controls are using the Chainer's Edict. So it is a very versatile card that goes in many different decks. And I think if Popper does, of course, take off, this is one from black that will go up the fastest. All right, so let's go on to red, which isn't really a red card. And that's what's really good about it is it's so flexible. Now, I, I would probably choose Electricery because it's just one of the go-to cards for wiping elves and, and other uh, token-based decks, especially when you have the Kadatha tokens that is, is starting to uh, gain dominance over the Boros Monarch. Uh, Electricers are starting to show up more and more in those deck lists. Electricers are also pretty good against Delver because it kills the Delvers before they flip, or if they're the Fairy Delver, it can basically kill all the fairies. However, the red card by far that sees the most play in Popper if you add up all the decks that it goes in is Gutshot. Gutshot sees a huge amount of play in many many popper decks it's really good in a lot of blitz decks this is a free base spell that can pump up your kiln fiends and do a damage it's just a good way to get delvers uh kill delvers before they flip i've seen burn decks play it before i've seen decks that don't even run red just run gut shots in the sideboard like mono mono white heroic i've even seen stompy put gut shot in the sideboard just because it's an early way to interact with those uh pesky delvers or fairies or things like that and yeah, it's, it's got a neat little trick, even with like this spell starter sprite that's trying to counter your one drop. You kill the spell starter sprite in response. They have zero fairies. It doesn't counter anything. So gut shot goes in a lot more than just red decks. Uh, right now, it's just showing it is going in red decks and a few blue decks. But yeah, Mono Blue Delver runs it. Again, I've seen it in just a ton of different decks for uh, Popper. And however, though, you can see that Modern is starting to play this, this card like crazy. And it's really because of the, the Phoenix decks. It's another free spell. So keep that in mind. This card is just getting hammered with demand. And it has had that spike since the, the uh, Ultimate Masters. This is really because of Phoenix. So Phoenix really made this card take off, especially the thing in the Ice Phoenix deck really loves it. And it settled down a little bit. Uh, but this price, I think, will continue to go up as Phoenix continues to dominate and Popper uh, decks will continue to outstretch the supply of this card. All right, so then on to last is green. Green is the Carrion Ranger, and this is because it double dips in, in two of the, well, I would say is the most popular three archetypes of green. So green, we have a token-based deck that's starting to gain popularity. Uh, it runs very similar to red-white tokens, just goes really, really wide. It doesn't really get killed by like the the black blue delvers that are trying to one for one you because you just you put out so many threats so they do run kieran ranger in it because it allows you to run a, lo a low land count and kind of ramp up mana if you kind of get stuck on it uh however both elves love the kieran ranger and stompy they both play it in a four of and again i've seen this deck in many other decks that uh, can get value out of when tapping a creature is fine. If we look down here, Stompy Elves is mainly what it's played in. It's even played in Legacy Elves. It's a popular commander uh, card with... The, we've had, like, Maverin that has been recently printed as an elf. 
Uh, I didn't think there was one out of Ravnica Legions. Was there an elf? Though? Or was there? I can't remember. But there's a couple elves out of Dominaria. Elves, there's always going to be elf commanders. I The Azuri is going to be a, a very popular elf commander for you know the rest of time. Uh, I use Kirin Ranger personally in Noth the Guild Leaf because it untaps an elf. Any sort of elf ball strategy is going to run these because they're really, really powerful with getting Priest of Titanias uh, untapped and whatnot. But what I like about this, though, is just the flexibility of where this card can go. Like I said, it's not showing some of these other lists that I end up having to put the Kirin Ranger, but there are some decks that's like, wow, that's their one drop of choice, and indeed it is. Uh, it's the Kirin Ranger, especially they'll have this with like other like red, red, uh, green stompy decks. I've seen it before as just like a safety way to untap your Nettle Sentinel. If you, you don't end up casting a green card that turn, you can just untap it and then hit it for a two, two for one, uh, over and over. So Kirin Ranger did have that price spike. It was one of them that, 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 uh, spiked up the quickest after the, um, Popper craze last year. It has had that huge price adjustment all the way back down to $3.30 from $5.50. So that 50 cent decrease. Uh, but it does tend to look like it's going back up. Carquinho's got it back up for four. There still is some copies at Channel Fireball. And the TCU market price has been dipping up. Like I was able to get these for not too long ago for about a buck twenty-five to a buck fifty, but those those are long gone now. And you actually are paying a little more premium for the Kirin Ranger. This is a card that hasn't been printed since Visions, uh, hasn't had any sort of, look at the promo. The FNM promo? Nah, that's gotta be wrong, right? Wow, that price spike on the FNM promo. Nah, TC is like 50 bucks. That's crazy though, if it really does go for $400. Should've been playing FNM back then, huh? Anyway, those are kind of my picks for one of each color. I hope this uh, video was helpful. This is a format I know a ton about. I don't think there's a lot of people that know much more about Popper than than, than I do, just because of how how much I've played on MT Joe before I quit MT Joe, how much I still play in store, but I still really keep up with the meta and still am a huge fan of the format. I like Popper personally as a store owner and as a player because people can't make the excuse that they got beat by someone else's wallet. Uh, Popper decks are very, very affordable for anyone. It's very easy to just buy an entire battle box. They're very easy sells too because if I am, am starting a tournament and we're doing Popper and someone doesn't have a Popper deck, I'm like, hey, I've got one on the shelf for 20 bucks and it's a tier deck. It's a, well, it's, it's, it's a step below a tier deck. There's just a few little missing pieces, but it's still nice and tack. That's what's really good about some of these popper decks too, is if you can't, even if you don't want to forward some of the, like when Chainer's Edict was expensive, for example, you could just do Diabolical Edict or Innocent Blood, and that'd basically be about the exact same uh, power level. So uh, popper's also kind of a cool format because it the, the skill is very intensive. Yes, matchups matter a ton, uh, but skill is definitely sided towards the, it feels like legacy as far as the, the, the skill level, uh, because the good player is going to have a huge advantage. It's not going to have a lot of autopilot decks like we have in, in standard, and you don't have huge effect cards. Um, and there's there's a beauty to that too, because it, it feels like a constructed format, but also has sort of that like draft-ish, you're playing a lower power level feel, but it's constructed. And the, the problem sometimes I have with standard is like when, Cards like Nexus of Faith that are just, or we've had cards of these big mana spells or, or these big planeswalkers or things that just tend to take over the games after they've been cast. And the whole game is all about, you know, trying to, to uh, race those out or stop those from ever hitting the board. Well, Popper is more of a one-for-one -one, tit-for-tat type format where, uh, again, it has a lot of decision-making and a lot of skill. So that's why I'm just incredibly in love with the format, had a lot of fun playing it. And I hope it continues to have a, uh, a very robust growth and i actually do expect that i don't know there is some some warning signs about popper we had gavin uh verhey tweet out what people would like to see in like a uh a limited popper environment like they're trying somehow to figure out a way to do it uh i don't know if that's very feasible because chase cards would be quite hard they'd have to do like some sort of masterpieces they're contained in them but have their rarity more feasible i don't know how they could do it how they could uh how they could pull it off. Maybe they could do it like a uh, Guilds of Ravnica Mythic Booster Box Edition where you get eight cards that are, you know, like these Judge Foil, like like the ones that it's named, for example, in a different frame, and that could get people to buy them to draft the sets. I don't know. I don't know how they could do it. But anyway, that is on the radar, so be very, very, very worried about that because popper cards, when they d tend to get reprinted, they crash very, very quickly. Some of them do tend to recover, though, like Gut Shot's a good example of them. Chainer's Edict seems like it's a, it's heading for that nice little recovery. And we've also had some that have been recently reprinted, like Mold Drifter, that didn't even it didn't even hurt the, their price when they were reprinted. They recovered immediately. So there is a lot of... of 
uh, demand for these type of cards. And I think it's worthwhile to keep up with the format in a market standpoint, uh, because I know these aren't big. Like a lot of finance people like laugh at my channel a lot because I'm always giving like this advice for these dollar, two dollar cards, which a lot of people don't find worth their time or money. But everyone's at a different level uh, on the whole finance uh, yes, yeah, some people are, are trading power all day long. I, I know those people. And some people are grinding the modern scenes and the standard scenes. But there are, each one of those, there's people too who are just trying to scrape away with these these small investments. I've told numerous stories in my uh, magic career where it was this type of stuff that allowed me to recover uh, when I didn't have uh, expendable income to be spending on magic. This is how I actually financed my magic hobby was just by by making good trades, really scraping the bottom of the barrel and that's why I like Popper. It's uh, you know, it's made me money in the past too. It's uh, got to learn community college to uh, to make a fake Reddit account and whine at me about buying out uh, particular cards. So at least I've achieved that. Anyway, we won't get into that much more. This is Kevin with the Rogue Market. Thanks for watching.